Would you join me in prayer? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. In the Hasidic teachings of Judaism, you will find this story. A man died and was brought before the heavenly court. When his sins and good deeds were placed on the scales, his sins far outweighed the good deeds he had done. His eternal soul was in jeopardy. But suddenly an angel in the heavenly court placed a fur coat on the scales of the good deeds. When this happened, the scale of good deeds shifted and became the heavier scale, and the man was sent to paradise. On his way to paradise, he asked the escorting angel, I cannot understand, what did the fur coat have to do with my judgment? And the angel replied, on a cold wintry night, you traveled on a sled, and a poor man asked you for a ride. You took him in, and noticing his thin clothes, you placed your fur coat on him to give him warmth. That one act of kindness offset all of your transgressions. I love this story from the sages of Judaism. It reminds me of the power, the weight, the balance given to us in the parable of Matthew 25, known as the final judgment. Here, Jesus offers his very last teaching in the Gospel of Matthew. And all of you know the Gospel of Matthew is a teaching gospel. So he has been teaching us this whole year all these things to take away, all these things to learn. And this is his final word to us. Just before he enters into his passion unto death and ultimately his resurrection from the dead, he begins with these words in Matthew. Hear them again. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne in his glory. All of the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. So on the surface, this is a simple story. It's about sheep and goats, right? The sheep are good, the righteous ones. They do amazing things for those around them. They feed the hungry. They give drink to the thirsty. They welcome the stranger. They clothe the naked. They care for the sick. They visit the prisoner. For their deeds of compassion, they enter eternal life. The goats are unrighteous ones. They don't lift a hoof for those suffering around them. And for their lack of action on behalf of humanity, they're sent to eternal punishment. Again, the summary, sheep, good, going to heaven. Goats, bad, going to hell. Should be the end of the story and we move on. But there's a lot more here than that. None of those represented by sheep and goats anticipated this kind of judgment. None had consciously recognized the Son of Man, the Christ, in others, especially not in people who needed help. Neither the sheep nor the goats saw the face of Jesus anywhere. Their behaviors are different, but their perceptions are the same. Think about that. Their perceptions are the same in this story. Their behaviors are different. For those who say, I can't give my time, my talent, my treasure to help somebody who's suffering because I don't see Jesus in them. I pity you. Jesus pities you. Because the last judgment tells us, when you see and act on behalf of the least of these, you see a human need, you see it and you act then and there on behalf of Jesus. It's that simple and it's that difficult. Simple and difficult may be the best way to describe the challenges any of us face when encountering someone in need in our lives. When you and I stand face to face with someone who's hungry, someone who's naked, someone who's thirsty, 
someone who's homeless, someone who's sick, someone who's imprisoned. Our compassion and our empathy may kick in. Hopefully it will kick in. I pray to God that each of us will see another human in need and respond. But the divide between simple and difficult grows if and when we do not, or worse yet, will not see the other as human. This truly comes to light when terrorism and war enter the human connection between and among people. We have witnessed the horrors and the ugliness of terrorism in our nation on September 11, 2001. And in the last few years, in the unmitigated and audacious attack uh, on the Ukrainians by Vladimir Putin and the Russians in February 2022, and now the terrorist attack by Hamas on October 7th, which left more than 1,200 men, women, children, and babies dead in southern Israel and 240 hostages taken. In each case, the inhumane assault on innocent men, women, and children triggered a defensive and ravishing response from the aggrieved and wounded nation. No one can deny that. The response sometimes is worse than the first action. In Israel and Palestine, a solution cannot be found when terrorists run Palestine and when Israel is led by a narcissistic, sociopathic, criminal president on the other side, a man who has shown for generations that he looks out only for himself and his own interests. In each case, those who do see their neighbors and friends, those who do care for others, get crushed as they reach out to care and make a difference in the midst of terror and war lust. Inside the conflict, they must rise and be heard and be the guides for setting up a better future for all people, in this case, Arabs and Israelis, Jews, Christians, and Muslims. And as we've come to know through the release of hostages, international people working in the land who live in Israel and Palestine. Roger Cohen, writing from Jerusalem in the New York Times just a few days ago, in a piece entitled, Between Israelis and Palestinians, a Lethal Psychological Chasm Grows, made this observation. In a conflict marked by complete incomprehension on both sides, the ability to see each other as human has been lost. He quotes Mohammed Darwashi, the director of the, the Strategy uh, Institute of Gavat Havaya Center for Shared Society, who promotes Jewish-Arab dialogue and is about an hour's drive north of Jerusalem. He says, each side begs for the status of a five-star victim. If you are stuck in victimhood, you see everyone else as victimizing and dehumanizing. The consequence, continues Cohen, is a psychological chasm so deep that Palestinians are invisible as individuals to Israeli Jews, and the Israeli Jews are invisible as individuals to the Palestinians. There are exceptions, of course. Some Israelis and some Palestinians have dedicated themselves to bridging this divide, but generally the narratives of the two sides diverge, burying any perception of shared humanity. And the result of this divergence is death and destruction in war created one against the other. I have seen this too. If your eyes fire up with hatred and disdain when you look at another human being, you will not see a way to make peace or to find peace or to be peace in relationship with that person or others who are close to that person multiplied out of a group of people for more than 76 years of seeing the other as evil or bad or the cause of all your pain and problems there is no easy way to get out of this loop it plays out until everyone is either dead or gone but then finds a way to continue in the next generation of unreconciled souls. 
Here at home, since the October terrorist attack by Hamas on the kibbutzes in southern Israel, I have been listening to and sitting with many of my Jewish sisters and brothers and some of my Muslim sisters and brothers as they share the pain they're experiencing. Their pain is intense and real. It is a pain that crosses over their own kind, if you will, to see and feel the pain of the other. In addition, they are experiencing the rise of anti-Semitic acts that have risen in America by 400% in the past six weeks. Anti-Semitism has risen in a way that we've never seen it rise before. So you see how this works? Something happens and you find cause to attack somebody else who didn't even get involved in the first place. A leader in a synagogue in Detroit was murdered just days after Hamas attacked Israel. In the name of support for Palestinians, protests in this region have turned ugly. Here in Columbus, two Ohio State University students were beaten up just a few weeks ago, leaving a bar after they were asked by the assailants if there were Jews. When they answered, they were thrashed and beaten to the ground. At Hillel House on campus that very same night, the place was vandalized by people screaming insults, tearing down the Israeli flag and destroying the property. In high schools around the area, we have seen a rise in anti-Semitism. In the high school from which my children graduated, Worthington Kilbourne High School, there was a walkout in support of Palestine, which vilified Jews and students were approaching Jews in the hallway making the Nazi salute of Zig Heil as they passed their classmates on their way to the next class. Just let that sit in. One Jewish teen who is a friend of our family told her father, I was fearful that day that all of my friends would get up and all of my classmates would get up and walk out and leave me in the classroom alone because I was a Jew. Wow. I can tell you this. You and I cannot stop the war in Israel and Gaza all by ourselves. We can share whatever it is we feel about it, but we can see our neighbors right near us. We can rise up. We can protect them and others who we do not know. Remember that it was silence that gave the Nazis the green light to keep eliminating and destroying Jews in Europe and North Africa. The Nazis counted on the lack of response to destroy Jews and wipe them from the face of the earth, which is the ultimate definition and practice of genocide. In his poem, A Servant to Servants, Robert Frost wrote, the best way out is always back through. Perhaps this is what Jesus was saying in his final words to humanity. You see, I think Jesus was really worried about us. I think when he delivered this last of his stories, his parables, he was worried about the poor who were being abandoned. He was worried that he had given himself over to them throughout his life, and soon he would be gone. And who would care for them next? I think he was really worried. He was trying to say to humanity, you can do this. We cannot get out of a loop of disdain and distress and hatred if we simply practice a life philosophy of fight or flight. We have to go back through and find our way out of one loop at a time in our lives. We can be freed from our psychological and spiritual loop by seeing and doing in relation to others. When we see the other and when we do the right thing for them, we break the cycle which intends to hold us captive. The key is seeing the human beside you as a human. That's very important, seeing the human who's beside you as a human. Our dehumanize, by dehumanizing them in any way, it will just lead us back onto the path of cruelty and unkindness, one which I know we don't want to do knowingly, but we can do unknowingly. If you do not see your neighbor as human, unleashing hate instead of love causes the utter 
disintegration of all of Jesus' teachings, all of his care and concern. Everything breaks down when you see your neighbor as less than human. Conversely, everything moves toward hope and healing when you see your neighbor as human and care for them. There is a lot to be said about doing the right thing without seeing God in the action. In other words, doing the right thing is not transactional. It should not be something you do to get anything back for what you did. It should be spiritual. It should be ethical. It comes from a seed and a source planted within you that is in action mode. If a person is hungry, you feed them. If they're naked, you clothe them. If they're thirsty, you give them something to drink. If they're alone and homeless, you shelter them and comfort them. If they're sick, you care for them. If they're in prison, you go see them. This is so clear and so transparent. I don't believe Jesus told this parable to scare people into charity. He wasn't trying to say, get ready, you'll go to hell if. He was saying, this is the consequence of living your hell in a way that is wrong in relation to your brothers and sisters. He knows that particular motivation leaves us trapped in our egotism, even if we did lessen others' suffering. Jesus knew that the genuine encounters that we have with the poor and all who are in need enlarge our heart and our vision as a giver. Solidarity makes us human. He invites us to know him in relationship with his beloved poor. He gave his life for them and for us. And when we fall in love with Christ in the poor and those who are suffering, we identify with the poverty and the pain that is in him. When we do this, we will want to serve him with them. The reign of Christ in Matthew's final parable encapsulates the gospel, full of ironies and twists, firsts and lasts, losing life and finding it. One way to sum it up, is captured by Pope Francis in words he delivered to priests several years ago on the eve of Christmas. He said, when you decide to know, to love, and to serve Christ, then you will end up smelling like his sheep, and then you will know you're a priest. That's a good word for every single one of us. When we start smelling like sheep, we know it's working. As Jesus points out, the person who meets another human being where they are and serves them in their place of need is blessed. They see enough to sense the need of another, but they don't see enough to realize it is Jesus they are serving, and that is the magic of it. The final lesson of life and faith that he leaves for us in Matthew's Gospel is so profound that we do it a disservice to talk it into the ground. And that's what I've just done. <laughs> so I'll stop before I don't have any voice. Like the man in the Hasidic tale headed to paradise, we get on the right path to salvation with simply one act of kindness. There's a saying in Judaism, if you save one life, you save the world. That's what we need to do. Focus on one act of kindness and one act of love, and then we will begin to see the change. And that's something we can start now. Amen.